Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, we were waiting for our other speaker, um, but I think we'll get going. My name is Dr. Monique Wubenhorst. It's a real pleasure to be here. I see so many friendly uh, faces and people I know, and this is an opportunity for us to discuss something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm an OBGYN physician and bioethics person, and so today we're going to talk about fulfilling the law of love, which is something that Jesus told us was so important. Um, so what does it have to do with the practice of bioethics? That's what we're going to try to explore. So we're going to start off our first presentation. It's going to be bioethics and the imago dei, the image of God, reproductive autonomy, and its eugenic impulses. Very timely and important topic. Uh, Mark Cherry from St. Edward's University is going to be presenting today. And uh, so um, Mark is going to talk about um, how within medicine, the imago dei calls Christians to recognize <laughs> Uh, the importance of interventions and their consequences. Oh, good morning. Great, okay. thank you. You're Apologies. fine. You're, you're fine. Um, so Mark is the Dr. Patricia A. Hayes Professor in Applied Ethics and Professor of Philosophy at St. Edward's University in Austin, Texas. His research um, encompasses ethics and bioethics together with social and political philosophy. He is editor of the Journal of Medicine and, Philo and Philosophy, Oxford University Press, senior edit editor of Christian Bioethics, also Oxford University Press, and editor in Chief of Healthcare Ethics Committee Forum, which is from Springer, and he's co-editor of the book series, The Annals of Bioethics, Rutledge, and editor of the book series, Philosophical Studies in Contemporary Culture. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Sue. Are we, are we using podiums? Yes, we are using podiums. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great joy to be here with you again at the University of Notre Dame. Um, Christians have long appreciated that medicine is permissible and its use generally encouraged so long as it does not involve sinful actions or otherwise impede one's relationship with God. All too often, however, human passions lead medical decision-making astray. This presentation utilizes the example of reproductive autonomy to illustrate why Christian bioethics must be firmly grounded within the church's mystical experience of God a knowledge of what it means to be created in the image of God and to seek to participate in his likeness. The church fathers recognized the Imago Dei as a lens through which properly to appreciate humanity's sovereign dignity and dominion over the natural world, appropriate use of intellectual reason, physical bodies, and free will. We are, after all, God's creation, designed to participate in his goodness, righteousness, and holiness, while also being a means through which God acts in his world, which is good. Vladimir Lossky's overview of the Imago Dei and the Church Fathers reveals a tapestry of applications, each of which provides insight into basic characteristics of our shared humanity. Sometimes the image of God is understood through man's dominion over the natural world. It is, quote, sought in the sovereign dignity of man and his lordship over the terrestrial world, end quote. Other times it's seen in particular aspects of our being, Quote, in his spiritual nature, in his soul, or in the principal ruling part of his being, in the mind, and the higher faculties such as the intellect, the reason, or the freedom proper to man, the faculty of inner determination, by virtue of which man is the true anchor of his actions, end quote. The focus at times regards specific qualities of the soul. Quote, its simplicity, or its immortality, or else it is described as the ability of knowing God, of living in communion with him, with the possibility of sharing the divine being, or with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the soul, end quote. Other times, as with Max St. Mac Macarius of Egypt, Lasky notes that the Imago Dei is identified with the formal condition of free will and human liberty, embodied in the faculty of free choice. Or that communion with God, whereby before the fall man was clothed with the word and the Holy Spirit. Saints Arrhenius, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory Palamas identify the image of God as characteristics of both body and soul. Quote, not only the soul, but also the body of man shares in the characteristics of the image, being created in the image of God. The word of man, says St. Gregory Palamas, is not applied to either soul or body separately, but to both together, since together they have been created in the image of God, end quote. In each case, these saints and fathers of the church are grappling with the inadequacy of human language to convey central elements of our created human nature and our relationship with God. Applying such aspects, of such insights to medicine, the Imago Dei calls Christians to recognize 
The medical interventions cannot be sufficiently evaluated if one only regards bodily functions, pain and suffering within an imminent horizon of human subjective needs and interests. A transcendent focus is also essential. For what, quoting from the Gospels, what, for what shall it profit a man if she'll gain the whole world and lose his soul? St. Basil the Great, for example, reminds Christians that medicine is a gift from God. He says, quote, each of the arts is God's gift to us, remedying the deficiencies of nature. The medical art was given to us to relieve the sick, in some degree at least. St. Basil notes approvingly that with mandrake, doctors give us sleep with opium, they lull violent pain. Still, he's careful to warn. He says, quote, to place the hope of your health in the hands of the doctor is the art of an irrational animal. In short, medicine is an important human good, but neither it nor the pursuit of any other earthly good should replace faith in God and obedience to his commands. Medicine must always be placed within this framework of a fully Christian life. Consider, for example, the ways in which desires can really distort how we see the world. Even a really great desire to give birth to a, human, a healthy child can distort one's proper relationship with God if one isn't careful. Central elements of reproductive medicine, for example, exploit this very natural paternal concern to embrace as their primary function the avoidance of the birth of any child that is less than fully perfect or otherwise considered desirable. As a result, much of reproductive medicine in both intention and result looks strikingly eugenic. Prenatal testing and abortion, for example, have become central to the achievement of political and personal goals to remove forms of disease and disability from the population. There exists real social pressure to ensure that children are free from any significant mental or physical disabilities. After all, a disabled child consumes public and private resources, impacts on career and financial goals, while also being at odds with a secular moral ethos that accents control over one's lifestyle and excellence in what one achieves. Secular bioethics encourages a reproductive ethos of what is called responsible parenting which holds that responsible parents ought to choose carefully when to become parents and of which children. This reproductive ethos normalizes not only contraception to control when to have children and medical selection of embryos for desirable traits through assisted reproductive technology, but also prenatal diagnosis and selected killing in utero of children with disabilities, deformities, undesirable genetic characteristics, or the unwanted sex. A friend of mine was uh, encouraged to have an abortion that when at 20 weeks uh, the sonogram showed a cleft palate. Uh, she looked at the doctor and said, I know a good plastic surgeon. Okay. And then the child was born without a cleft palate. Okay. Uh, when governments officially endorse, uh, encourage abortion for otherwise or otherwise discourage the births of specific groups of individuals, such actions strongly suggest an underlying eugenic motive. Denmark, for example, instituted routine prenatal screening for Down syndrome in 2006. Other European countries uh, followed. Denmark's stated goal was to address Down syndrome as a public health measure. Data demonstrate that putting this policy into practice has in fact reduced the number of children with Down syndrome. But as we know, there's only one way to do that. You have to in fact uh, abort every child that tests positive for Down syndrome. Right? There also remains a common desire amongst many to improve children through what are judged to be responsible reproductive choices. Here one might consider selective breeding practices such as those encouraged through gamete donation and IVF. Maxwell Melman, for example, documents that places like the California Cryobank provide sperm purchasers with a 26-page profile on each donor. Michael Sandel offers the example of an advertisement that appeared in some Ivy League college newspapers offering $50,000 for OVA from students who were, quote, at least 5 feet 10 inches tall, athletic, without a family history of major medical problems, and a combined SAT score of 1,400 or above, end quote. Other websites claimed to offer OVA from fashion models, and at one point a website offered specifically tailored embryos for sale. Where the sexual revolution sought to separate sexual activity from reproduction, forms of assisted reproductive technology have severed any necessary connection between intimate sexual relations and pregnancy. 
with the commercial availability of sperm donation, a husband or any male sexual partner for that matter has been rendered superfluous, if unwanted. The normalization of surrogate motherhood has similarly rendered a wife or any female sexual partner also superfluous. The availability of gamete donor, uh, donor gametes and donor embryos has centered any necessary genetic connection between a pregnant woman and the child she is carrying. It is now possible for parents to have their own biologically related children without the burden or pleasures of sexual relations, the challenges or joys of pregnancy, or the me medical and physical challenges of labor and delivery. Couples paying women to gestate and give birth to children on their behalf is in fact a growing business. Where once commercial surrogacy was denounced as a practice that exploited the poor and the weak, in some quarters it is now celebrated because it aids individuals and couples to, who are unable to have children to exercise what are assumed to be basic human rights to reproductive autonomy. Specialty clinics have been established to assist homosexual men to become parents, for example. Gestational surrogates are expected to give the child to the intended parents at birth, where it is entirely possible that one or both of the intended parents may not have any genetic connection to the child. While laws vary, in some countries the genetic surrogate's name may never even appear on the birth certificate. The use of donor gametes and gestational carriers as a result has required a rethinking of biological and familial concepts. With some exceptions, the term mother has historically commonly referred to a particular biological relationship. The woman who conceived was pregnant and gave birth to the child. While a woman might become a mother by adopting a child, the use of donor gametes and surrogate arrangements introduces additional parties who each have some kind of biological maternal relationship to the child. The woman who nurtured the baby in her womb and gave birth whether or not she contributed genetic material is in some sense the child's biological mother. It would seem difficult to deny that the woman who gave birth is the child mother, at least in some sense. At the same time, if the child was a result of IVF, using another couple's sperm and ova, the gestational mother would have no genetic relationship to the child. In that biological sense, the woman who provided the ovum would be the child's biological mother. Myochondrial DNA replacement technology introduces yet other parties into this reproductive mix, each with some claim to be the child's biological mother. A team of researchers at Oregon's Health and Science University in Beaverton created human embryos in which they substituted the original myochondrial DNA with a donor's genetic material. The result is an embryo with two genetic mothers. Their goal was to generate babies, while avoiding myochondrial defects, which are implicated in certain types of diseases. The practical outcome, however, is the creation of a child with three biologically related parents, two mothers and a father. The mother provides the ovum, the mother who provides the donor uh, myochondria, and the father provides the sperm. If a gestational surrogate who was not one of the other two women carries the child to term, the newborn infant could claim three biological mothers in some sense and a father. With surrogate motherhood, IVF, genetic, uh, prenatal genetic testing with abortion and similar technology has also come a greater sense of the commodification of children, often as noted in the furtherance of at least implicit eugenic goals. Purchasers of surrogacy services, for example, at times feel free to react, reject children they judge to be defective. In one of only a growing number of cases, uh, a surrogate mother gave birth to twins, one of whom was diagnosed with congenital myotopic dystrophy. Although the surrogate mother had reportedly been paid approximately 12,000 pounds to gestate and bear the children, the, the mother who purchased the services only took possession of the healthy boy, refusing to accept the disabled twin sister. In a different case, another set of parents were asked if they wished to meet the surrogate mother of their children. The couple reportedly bluntly responded, she's doing a job for us. How often do you communicate with your builder or your gardener? She'll get paid. We don't need to see her. As long as she's healthy and delivers our children, she's done a job for us. Full stop. While surrogate mothers may be appreciated as no more than paid labor, children here seem to have become just another I seem to have forgotten my rest of my pages. Could you hand me? Oh, sure. <laughs> Philosophy professors, you just can't trust us. <laughs> Boy. Right? And by the way, those of you in the back, please feel, feel free to seat yourself. There's seats no, right up front. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs>
Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, that. no, it's fine. Children seem to become just another accoutrement of modern life to be designed and chosen. The selection process for sperm and ova donors has become internet-based, much like shopping for any other commercial item. One, as one hopeful mother reflected, I chose my son by clicking and unclicking a series of boxes, not unlike online dating. There was no easy way for me to choose some, from so many flawless but relatively indistinguishable men, particularly when this choice would have had such a profound impact on my life and the life of my child. So I kept browsing around spending Friday nights curled up with the top 1% of the male population. I mean, pretty soon you're just going to be ordering them on Amazon, right, with overnight delivery. Uh, parents may even select for characteristics in support of specific subcultures. In 2002, for example, a deaf lesbian couple used a friend with five generations of deafness in the family as a sperm donor so as to greatly increase the likelihood of having a deaf child. They were successful. Family building here involves less chance than ever before. The expectation is that donor gametes, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, IVF, prenatal diagnosis, abortion, and so forth, provide women with the autonomy to avoid giving birth to unhealthy, defective, defective, or otherwise unwanted babies, while also set, selecting for a wide range of characteristics. Advocates have advanced what they call a principle of procreative beneficence, asserting that couples, quote, couples or single reproducers should select the child of the possible children they could have, who is expected to have the best life. Such judgments reflect the view that there may be important reasons for ch couples to avoid giving birth to what they consider to be defective children and to select for children who are most likely to have the highest level of well-being. Or characteristics like intelligence, that they're likely to contribute to personal social well-being. Better quality children are to be built and delivered at the time of one's choosing. The term eugenics is usually studiously avoided, right? The eugenic consequences of such practices, however, are very real. Such initiatives intentionally eliminate large numbers of children each year. Insofar as the goal is to support reproductive autonomy, one does not find prenatal testing and abortion for undesirable DNA profiles like Down syndrome problematic. And, what, and if that's the case, then on what moral grounds could you consistently reject the use of abortion for sex selection or to avoid having a child with other characteristics such as deafness, blindness, homosexuality, or race? If we're already doing it for some, where's the consistent? We have to be consistent about it, they argue. However, traditional Christianity has long settled judgments regarding the evils of abortion, infanticide, now conveniently referred to as infant euthanasia in certain countries to make it sound nicer, and the inappropriateness of surrogate motherhood. It is unclear, however, what resources secular bioethics can bring definitively to sort through these moral choices. Christianity understands that children ought to be appreciated as gifts made in the image of God. Our job as parents is to help them participate with and grow in his likeness as much as they are individually able. Removing children from the family for being less than perfect, falling short of the product that one hoped for, is deeply sinful. Now just a brief conclusion. St. Maximus reminds us that as often it is the distortion of human goods rather than the goods themselves which are as sinful. He notes, quote, it is not food that's evil but gluttony, mm -hmm. not the begetting of children but unchastity, not material things but avarice, not esteem but self-esteem, this being so, it is only the misuse of things that is evil, end quote. It is for such reasons that with regard to medicine, St. Basil forbids whatever requires an undue amount of thought or trouble or involves a large expenditure of effort or causes our whole life to revolve, as it were, around solicitude for the flesh. Medicine is never supposed to become an all-consuming endeavor. Working to save life at all costs, obsessive plastic surgery in search of the perfect figure, or excessive or inappropriate use of reproductive medicine, all risk turning the desires of this life and the ministrations of medicine into idols. Now be careful. It can be appropriate to save life, to obtain corrective plastic surgery, or to seek medical assistance for reproduction. Again, it's the distortion of those goods, not the goods themselves, which is sinful. 
Because medicine promises to ameliorate the challenges of sexuality, reproduction, suffering, and death, it has become, for the secular world, a commanding good. As a result, the contemporary secular culture has come to affirm basic rights to autonomy driven healthcare, including extensive access to reproductive technology, prenatal testing, and abortion on demand. The secular culture accepts such practices because it has demoralized all such choices mm -hmm. to issues of lifestyle decision making. They're not important, serious questions anymore. They've been totally demoralized and deflated. Patients are appreciated as in authority to define the right, the good, and the virtuous for themselves. And often physicians appear as little more than technicians whose social role requires assisting patients in developing and supporting whatever the patient's self-pleasing lifestyle happens to be. Reference to any underlying or, or foundational moral law, much less obedience to God or recognition of the Imago Dei has simply been swept away by our culture. Such secular bioethical impulses, however, must be resisted. As illustrated, reproductive medicine all too often presents the child as a commodity to be, to be shaped according to our own creative desires, with parental love conditioned upon successful production of what they have determined to be good. Lost is any recognition of each child's intrinsic and essential goodness as part of God's creation. Such bioethical choices are not only distort the significance of parenthood, but also disfigure our relationship with God the Creator. Steeped in the permissive contemporary culture, it is difficult to appreciate the union of husband and wife as the uniquely appropriate locus of reproduction, that utilizing donor gametes uh, or gestational surrogacy inappropriately involves a third party and the reproductive relationship of husband and wife or that IVF typically involves the destruction of unwanted embryos. Indeed, men and women have generally lost sight of the importance of having and raising godly children. But as St. John Chrysostom summarizes and reminds us, he says, quote, hear ye this, ye fathers bring up your children with great care and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let us bestow great care upon them and do everything that the evil one may not rob us of them, end quote. Christian families appreciate that children are not just another accoutrement of one's particular lifestyle preferences. They are essential for our struggle to salvation. Parents are called to reproduce and to trust in God for the protection of their families. Here the idea is to see that Christianity is not simply a set of, of philosophical principles, an historical interpretation of text, or a particular set of values. Instead, it is to be seen as a way that one lives that leads one to encounter with God himself. As a result, Christian bioethics must always be grounded in the church's mystical experience of God and to work to reorient us towards him. Again, as St. Basil reminds us, Christian medicine and Christian bioethics ought to be shaped with full recognition of God's commands and the rightly oriented Christian life. Approached correctly, medicine can play an important role in one's life, but secular goals should not undermine Christian truths and medical care must not replace Christian therapy for the soul. Y'all thank you so much for your kindness. people coming in, please come in. There's seats scattered around. Don't be embarrassed to um, walk in. No one is going to stare at you or whisper or anything like that. So there's two seats here, and then there's scattered seats throughout. So those of you who want to come up. So thank you very, very much. That was, uh, that was, that, that was just terrific. So our second speaker is Andrew Muller from University of Oxford. Uh, Andrew is going to, his talk's going to come more from an evangelical perspective. And uh, Andrew is a, a the philosophy student who's working on the history of eugenics, very important topic, at the University of Oxford. He also works for the Boundaries of Humanity Project based at Stanford um, and previously was a Christian minister for nearly a decade. So welcome. We had asked that I go last. That's okay. Oh, you want to go left? That's what, uh, to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, is that okay? Is I, don't, I don't mind going down. Yeah, that was yeah. requested you ready? by you ready? someone yeah. with okay. a comment. Okay, great. I'm sorry that, that was not confirmed. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I should right. apologize. Here we go. Um, so Javier Sim Simmons is uh, from the Australian Catholic University, um, and he's going to talk about bioethics as therapy. Uh, Javier is a uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. His research interests include ethical issues at the beginning and end of life, conscientious objection, ethical issues in aged care, 
and pandemic ethics. His recently completed PhD thesis focused on the allocation of life-saving healthcare resources. Javier has taught bioethics for several years and has worked with the Catholic healthcare sector on projects related to ethics education. In 2020, he was awarded, awarded a Fulbright. Congratulations. Um, and he was a scholar and resident at Georgetown University's Kennedy Institute of Ethics from September 2021 to March 2022. Thank you very much. Welcome, Javier. Thank Thanks very much, and um, wonderful to, to uh, be here at the conference this year. I was um, lucky enough to attend last year. I didn't present, um, which some people say is the, uh, is the best way of attending a conference, when you just get to enjoy wonderful presentations and you have no responsibilities yourself. But, um, but I thought uh, this year I, I would um, present, and particularly because I think that um, uh, this, this topic of uh, transhumanism and um, <coughs> Uh, I think the the distortion of the character of the proper character of medical practice uh, is is a genuine uh, issue for um, of grave concern for uh, for for people of goodwill and particularly people working within the Catholic intellectual tradition, given our understanding of human nature and human dignity. And I wanted to propose what ultimately I hope to become a book project um, uh, entitled Bioethics as, as Therapy. And, uh, and, and in this presentation, I'll, I'll cover three topics um, very briefly. First of all, I'm going to talk about transhumanism in medicine. Uh, and then second, secondly, I'm going to offer a bit of an, a very cursory account of the human condition, a, a, the a theory of the human condition uh, that's admittedly quite superficial, but at least will do for my purposes, the purposes of my argument. And I'll talk about the proper stance we ought to adopt towards the human condition and then lastly, I'm going to expand a bit upon this idea of bioethics as therapy, because uh, many of you may be wondering um, what, what exactly does that mean. So first of all, um, I thought I'd, I'd touch briefly on transhumanism in medicine. And I think the context for this, this thought of mine is that a lot of, a lot of people believe that transhumanism is characterised primarily by uh, technologies that seek to, say, extend life or make us more intelligent or more athletic or more good looking or whatever takes your fancy. Uh, but I think that's a little bit misguided to reduce transhumanism to those practices. And I actually think that transhumanism, it runs right through contemporary medical practice. And in fact, certain forms of accepted medicine today uh, that are central to what a lot of doctors do are in fact manifestations of transhumanism. So that's my, my claim in the first section. So here are a few um, major bioethical issues, abortion, emergency contraception, assisted reproduction for social infertility um, and euthanasia. And, uh, and all of these are, ca are characterised as, as medical practices and by their proponents are considered essential medical care, like basic medical care or something of that kind. However, when you really think about it, there's nothing therapeutic about these practices. Um, pregnancy is not a disease. And I, I mean, I'm not a medical specialist, but I think I'm on fairly good grounds to make that claim. Um, and, uh, and, and nor is the fetus a parasite. Like, like there's this bizarre culture in, in at least moral philosophy and practical ethics where, where this thought is taken very seriously, like the idea that the, the fetus can plausibly be characterised as, as a parasite, as parasitic on the mother. And uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson's article, A Defence of Abortion, is a good example of that, the idea of the talented violinist hooked up to another member of the orchestra uh, for nine months uh, and characterised as a parasite on uh, that, that individual. And, and that's a completely misleading thought. I think it's a sleight of hand in the end. It's, it's, it's setting up the debate in a particular way so that you come to the right conclusion, the conclusion that your interlocutor wants you to come to. Uh, however, it's misleading. I don't think that, um, that there's, there's any plausible basis for that thought. Um, contraception. Well, conception is, is a natural outcome of sexual in intercourse. And I think that's, that's important to, to remind people of uh, because perhaps we can forget that. Uh, assisted reproduction for social infertility. Um, there's no underlying pathology that's being addressed. And, and even just the term like social infertility is medicalizing, I think, a form of desire fulfillment in medicine. Um, couples, single parents or, or same-sex couples who want to conceive, 
um, and for obvious reasons cannot conceive, uh, want to use assisted reproduction to, to conceive. Um, and then lastly, euthanasia, perhaps the most egregious example of this, that, that there's nothing therapeutic about ending someone's life. Uh, and the, the claim might be made that you're, you're treating suffering, but um, obviously in medicine, there, there's, a, there's some sort of cost-benefit analysis that ought to take place, and surely like ending someone's life is a pretty big cost. Um, in, in the mix there, but, but, uh, but I think that's important in the context of euthanasia because often euphemisms are used in this debate, such as calling euthanasia assisted dying, which is the preferred term in my neck of the woods uh, in Australia, or um, medical aid in dying in Canada, um, or even just euthanasia, um, and not actually describing it as a form of um, assisted suicide, not characterising it as suicide, um, is, is potentially misleading. Um, so, to move on to the central claim of this, this section of the presentation, um, I, I mentioned that I think that these forms of medical practice are, are kinds of transhumanism. Well, here's just a very, a very cursory definition of transhumanism, which, which I don't think um, does full justice to the philosophical and theological foundations and precursors to transhumanism, but will do for our purposes. It's essentially a philosophical, cultural and political paradigm according to which human nature is inherently deficient and befitting of alteration and, more importantly, replacement, um, transcending our human condition. Transhumanists seek not just to improve human well-being, they seek to alter the very parameters of human existence such that our existence is no longer human but in fact a superior post-human form of existence. Uh, so. Ultimately, any biotechnology that seeks to alter the fundamental parameters of the human condition and human nature can be conceived of as an expression of transhumanism. Now, this includes life extension technology or military exoskeletons or uh, human enhancement of various forms, but it also includes contraception, prenatal diagnosis, uh, IVF, abortion, euthanasia, and a host of other practices that are currently widely accepted to be part of medicine. And I mentioned pre -di prenatal diagnosis as a particularly pernicious example because in some societies now um, there's, there's a boast that uh, Down syndrome has been eliminated. Um, so in some Scandinavian countries, for example, uh, there's, there's incredibly low rates of uh, um, uh, Down syndrome pregnancies that don't uh, result in an abortion where, um, where, where the child is actually um, brought to term and... Uh, and you actually have um, Down syndrome members of the community, that, that, that's becoming an increasingly rare uh, reality in, in many, many countries. And uh, that's, I think, where transhumanism links up in a pretty clear way with eugenics um, and, uh, and, and, and the new eugenics, as it's sometimes labelled in the literature. So, um, at the heart of most neuralgic bioethical issues of our time is, is an inability to accept one dimension or other of the human condition. Because I do think that these, these claims are they're two dimensions of the same reality, an inability to accept the human condition, a desire to transcend the human condition and human nature, um, the two sides of the same coin. Uh, which is why I'm going to now talk about the human condition. What is it? What's its normative status? What attitude ought we adopt to it? <coughs> So it's been variously theorised, this concept, throughout the history of philosophy and theology. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm, I'm just going to work with a very basic account of the human condition. So it's like the essential components of our human existence, birth, growth, aspirations, emotions, relationships, family, ageing and death. These are, these are the basic mile, um, uh, hallmarks of a human life. And, and also, perhaps one can add, our, our uniquely human mode of experiencing the world. Um, which I think includes, as I mentioned, emotions, but also just experiencing it, so viewing the world through human eyes, um, like feeling the world with the human sense of touch. Um, Thomas Nagel famously wrote an essay entitled, like, What Is It To Be A Bat? Um, the philosopher Thomas Nagel. And uh, um, it's, it's quite hard to characterise what's unique about the experience of one species or other. But certainly, as a members of the human race, we can, we can certainly identify and um, uh, know through our own experience what this concept looks like. 
Um, the human condition is part of the given or the unbidden. The unbidden is a term taken from the bioethicist William F. May, uh, who heavily influenced the work of Michael Sandel, which was mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, he um, wrote extensively about the, the, the notion that um, openness to the unbidden is an important virtue uh, in human life. Uh, openness to the essential features of our lives that are gifted to us, not chosen. And note well that the idea of the given need not imply that it is gifted by God specifically, uh, though it is a central tenet of Catholic bioethics that, that, that life is a gift from God. Um, as I've mentioned, the human condition structures our experience of the world. It structures the things we value, friendship, family, knowledge and health. We value them because of our human nature and condition. And there's, all, there's arguably also an authentic way of living, a manner that's cognizant of the realities of our human condition. In my abstract, I mentioned Stoic thought. And the Stoics, uh, from some perspectives, are perhaps a bit extreme in this respect. Like, you've got some Stoics saying, like, when you kiss your child at night, remember that they are mortal. It's a bit of an um, extreme way of approaching, <laughs> uh, coming to terms with our mortality. But nevertheless, I think the Stoics were onto something uh, insofar as they... Uh, we're highlighting the importance of living in a manner that's always cognizant of the, 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 the fundamental characteristics of our, our human condition and the limits that that places on us, that there's actually something virtuous about living in such a way. Um, which brings us to the topic of coping with the existential realities of human life. The, the life circumstances which are the context for issues like abortion, assisted reproduction, euthanasia, are circumstances in which one comes face to face with the human condition. I think this is an important insight because the claim is not when we reject abortion um, as a moral or when we say that euthanasia is suicide, the claim is not that the, the experiences that might motivate one to seek out these procedures, that those experiences somehow ought to be discounted as superficial, inauthentic, um, uh, misleading, like that's not at all the claim that's being made. Um, the claim is being made is that the, the, the question is not bad, the answer's bad. Um, and, and to what extent we should ask, is medicine offering good options to people grappling with these, these fundamental aspects of our, our human nature um, and, and the limitations that our condition imposes on us? Biotechnologies in many cases is used to alter reality rather than helping us to grapple with reality. And as such, it becomes an accomplice in existential escapism. Um, escaping rather than uh, coming to terms with uh, our human form of existence. And we should also not underestimate how eliminating elements of the human condition would, would fundamentally change our experience in radical ways. Sometimes when people discuss the topic of transhumanism, I don't think they fully understand the implications of it. And when you read a novel like Brave New World, you get a bit more context that um, what would it look like, for example, if we were to live in a life, live, live in a world where there was no emotion and there were no deep relationships that, that society and the state uh, effectively outlawed or, or made it impossible to have deep relationships? What would that kind of a life look like? And there might be, as there was in the sexual revolution, uh, a, an initial attraction to that kind of a life, a life where we can engage in sexual relationships without consequences, um, undesired consequences. But, uh, but pretty soon, one realises that um, when everyone belongs to everyone else, no one really belongs. Um, that there, is, there is a fundamental existential disorientation that occurs uh, when um, we uh, effectively alienate ourselves from our human condition. Uh, sorry, I, I missed the slide. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that's, uh, that brings us to this idea of like accepting the human condition and, and um, what attitude ought we adopt to the human condition? So William, William May has a, a, um, a good essay that he produced for the um, President's Council on Bioethics on the, uh, the, he drew effectively a comparison between science and parenting. And he argued that scientists, when they're engaged in their, in their, in their work and their research, face something analogous to the, the challenge that parents face. Uh, on the one hand, trying to uh, create a better world 
seek to find solutions for the problems that we're confronted with. In the case of your child, seeking, seeking to, to sort of cult, to, to cultivate virtue in your child um, to, uh, to help them to be a better person. And on the other hand, uh, accepting the fundamental parameters of the reality that's in front of us. In the case of, um, of parenting, you need to accept your child. In the case of science, we need to accept reality uh, as, 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 it's under, as it, um, it manifests in the form of, of human nature, um, rather than recoiling from it in, in Gnostic revulsion is an expression that uh, William May uses, and I think it's a very good one at that, because there is something Gnostic about transhumanism, the idea that uh, embodiment as such is something almost revolting, almost disgusting, and, uh, and something to be... Uh, to be transcended. I had a great chat last night with um, David McPherson, who's here at this uh, conference, uh, and I strongly recommend his work to you. Um, McPherson identifies a series of limiting virtues that are concerned with recognising the proper limits of human life, the virtues of limits. And these, I think, are, are virtues that we, we all ought to practise. Um, McPherson contrasts a choosing and controlling stance to the gifted character of human life with an accepting and appreciating stance towards the given. The virtues of limits include humility, reverence, moderation, contentment, neighbourliness, loyalty. Um, I'm not sure whether McPherson claims that this is a, an exhaustive list, but certainly this is a pretty good place to start, um, the kinds of virtues that we need to cultivate uh, to uh, be well adjusted in the world. And lastly, uh, I wanted to briefly comment on this notion of bioethics as therapy. Um, in what way might we conceive of as bioethics as playing a therapeutic role? Well, up until now, bioethics has largely performed a regulatory function in society um, in the form of institutional review boards or government committees, presidents, councils, um, and so on and so forth public inquiries, there might be bioethicists who get, get appointed to public inquiries to contribute an ethical perspective, but it's, it's a largely institutional regulatory function that bioethics is performed. We ought to consider, however, to what extent the most fundamental task of bioethics is therapeutic, helping humanity to come to terms with the human condition. And in the end, much of the task of bioethics is not so much practical ethical debate, but rather cultural rehabilitation in which a society can be disabused of unhelpful ways of approaching nature, the human body and the mysteries of human life. And this effectively, I think, is what it means, like part of what it means at least, to cultivate a culture of life in society as opposed to a culture of death. This is not about denying that there are real issues surrounding the most neuralgic bioethical debates of our society. On the contrary, it's about approaching bioethical problems in a deeper way and robustly engaging with the realities of the human condition and cultivating virtues that help us to embrace this condition. So in conclusion, many of these debates that I've mentioned are underpinned by a desire to alter one aspect or other of our human condition. I've articulated quite a different perspective on the human condition, one um, that I think ultimately amounts to an alternative bioethics, because what is ethics after all but a question about how ought we live? And uh, what should bioethics be, after all, than a, uh, an answer to the question, what, what stance ought we adopt to our human condition? We ought to exercise the virtues of limits when approaching the use of biomedical technology. And we also ought to think deeply about how this therapeutic task of bioethics is a task for us all. In the end, the culture of life is not a, uh, a, a, a ta creating a culture of life is not a task that John Paul II intended to be consigned to the, uh, the institutional limits of bioethics. Uh, it's a task for us all and something that we should all take very seriously. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks very much. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> so um, I think we're going to have our last presentation now and uh, from, uh, from Andrew. So Andrew, uh, as I was saying earlier, is coming from um, University of Oxford, and he's going to talk today about bioethics in the light of Christ's work in creation and new creation. I gave you more of his uh, bio a little bit earlier, so welcome.
And here you can see my title, but more to the point, my goal today is to assess the project of radical life extension in the light of Christ's work in creation and new creation. And I think instinctively, most of us would say that we expect to live into our 70s, 80s, or perhaps 90s. And if asked, I imagine many of us would say that the absolute oldest we would ever expect to live is somewhere around 120 years of age. And we might say this as a result of our scientific expertise or simply because the oldest person in modern recorded history lived 122. So let's contrast these assumptions with the project of radical life extension, which typically does not center on the treatment of individual diseases. It instead usually focuses on combating what are referred to as the hallmarks of aging or various contributors to aging using methods like gene therapy or senolytics in order to improve one's overall quality of life, increase what is referred to as one's health span or total number of healthy or productive years, and radically increase one's lifespan by preventing the development of diseases that are associated with aging. And for the sake of clarity and time, what I want to assess today is not any particular intervention, but rather the collective project of seeking to enable humans to one day live to 300, 500, or perhaps even 1,000 years by reversing or inhibiting the natural and universal aging process. And I'm tabling many other issues today, but there are, of course, very informed folks, including those involved with the Boundaries of Humanity project that I'm a part of, who don't believe that there's any reasonable possibility in the near midterm of humans achieving radically extended lifespans. But as venture capitalists are pouring tens of millions of dollars into such efforts, it's worth assessing whether such a project ought to be undertaken at all, regardless of its likelihood to succeed. And there you can see the hallmarks of aging mapped out, Though since this visual was created in 2013, more debate has occurred regarding the relative contributions of each hallmark to the aging process, and even which hallmarks should be on the list. And Aubrey de Grey, one of the most vocal proponents of radical life extension, tells us this, what I'm after is not living to a thousand. I'm after letting people avoid death for as long as they want to. And I included a visual reference to Neuralink and brain-computer interfaces with this slide, because radical life extension is often aspirationally associated with a larger set of efforts, like the promotion of brain-computer interfaces for non-therapeutic purposes, that are united by the desire to break beyond the boundaries of our shared humanity. And here you can see several other quotes on radical life extension, the first being from David Sinclair at Harvard Medical School. So let me start out with several uncontroversial points that I think most folks here would agree with. The first being that Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity, was God the Father's agent in creation. One theologian puts it this way, as the one entrusted with the task of acting on God's behalf, the Father grants, or we might say granted, Jesus the task of creating the universe. And we are told some formulation of this several times in the New Testament. For example, in John 1, 1 through 3, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Furthermore, as it is evident from the work of Jesus in creation, he can rightly be described as our Lord, and indeed Lord over all creation. Mm -hmm. Revelation 17, 15 states this, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And Hebrews 1, 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So Christ, we see in the book of Hebrews, was not only God the Father's agent in creation, but he is Lord over creation and upholds it by the very word of his power. Drawing these ideas together, we see that Jesus is rightly described as creator and Lord of all human beings, and so all bioethical reflections and prescriptions must be in accord with his life and teachings and work. More particularly, bioethical reflections must be in accord with the New Testament's account and analysis of the life, work, and teachings of Jesus Christ. And now here I come to imagine what might be a more controversial point. And what I'm offering is not a set of definite conclusions. I'm instead offering a Jesus-saturated perspective in order to get to the very bottom of the relevant ethical issues relating to radical life extension. And I want to offer a set of conclusions in order to generate more discussion and analysis on a very complex subject. So with that said, I suggest the following. Number one, and uncontroversially for Christians, Jesus is Lord, creator, and second person of the Trinity. And number two, the divine appointment of the current maximum human lifespan, while a consequence for human sin and not a good part of original creation, can be understood as in accord with the will of Jesus. Now the second point is a bold one. 
as it naturally suggests that we ought not to radically exceed this maximum time span of around 120 years, even if we want to give or take a few decades on that number. In my own opinion, I imagine it one day might be possible to radically exceed the 120 year lifespan, but similar to my thoughts on IVF, just because we're able to do something does not mean that it aligns with the will of Jesus. So to help in my assessment of the project of radical life extension, let's consider a thought experiment together. Imagine that a young adult of around 18 or 19 years of age goes off to college and learns that she, as a result of the aging process common to all human beings, will almost certainly die before the age of 120. And to help, let's assume the daughter somehow knows for a fact that she will live to at least 100 years old. Nevertheless, the daughter decides to sue her parents as she believes it was wrong for them to bring her into a world where her lifespan is so limited. Instinctively, many of us would initially respond to hearing about this lawsuit by saying that it's the fate of all human beings to die, and like the Bible says in Psalm 90, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. And remember that the parents in our thought experiment are being sued simply for bringing a child into the world who will age and die, and we can guess that her death will likely be the result of an age-related disease. The absolute best the young lady can hope for at this point in time is roughly 120 years. So let's continue to imagine that the daughter lays out her case. What might she say to the court? Another way of asking this is what does she believe is the purpose of a human life and how can we know when this purpose or these purposes have been fulfilled? Well, she might say that 100 years is not enough time to enjoy with her friends and family and that these limited years don't provide her with enough time to properly look after her family. Or she might say that it's not enough time to accomplish other work she cares about, possibly even noble ventures like partnering with an NGO or another charity to help the needy. On the more negative side, she might point out that the unnamed disease that will likely take her life will be accompanied by discomfort and possibly very real suffering, and she will feel all manner of other discomforts as she ages. Now her desire reasonably, might say, reasonably many might say, is to live a life free of pain and suffering, which may just be another way of saying that the purpose of life is to be able to enjoy it. And this may lead her to want to provide new definitions of our notions of health and disease, which I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A time. But also of immense importance, all her friends and family will die, and certainly it's reasonable to say that one of the purposes of life is to know, care, know love, and care for other human beings, but all these relationships will seemingly end by way of death. And of course, I don't have a time to offer comprehensive theology of death, but the daughter is definitely onto some things here, and the words of the late evangelist Billy Graham can tell us a bit more. He says, the Bible teaches that death is an enemy of mankind and God. I'm not speaking of the weakness and fear and pain and distress. I'm speaking of death itself. It is an enemy. It snatches away people in the prime of life when they are still needed by their family, their work, their nation. It leaves behind the sorrowing widow or widower and children. And Graham goes on to say that there's no death in the Garden of Eden, no pain, no tears, and no suffering. So like Graham, I'm an evangelical, and I, I would add to this that death is an enemy because it cuts us off from so much that is good, and for those who reject Jesus, it cuts them off from all that it is good. And death leaves in its wake loved ones who themselves suffer emotionally, economically, and even physically. This does not even begin to address the associated psychological and physical suffering that is so often experienced by all parties in the lead up to death. And so we know, save some incredible breakthrough from the radical life extension community, that we will all die and that our lives are highly unlikely to surpass 120 years and that we will face emotional and physical discomfort and possibly very real suffering. We know that the enemy will come for us. And note here that I'm not arguing that people of all ages ought to passively embrace death and avoid medical care. It would actually seem to me a very good thing if more and more people could live closer to 120 years as death indeed is an enemy. Now this next point I want to make is in line with the position of most Christians throughout history, though it's more disputed today. But to assess this lawsuit as Christians, we would also need to know why human beings in particular die. And notice here I'm not talking about animal death. So I'm not speaking also of the underlying processes or breakdowns that contribute to aging, but a theological matter outlined in the teachings of the Old and New Testaments. So we are told in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, that therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, 
even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So in this passage, the Apostle Paul is reflecting on Genesis chapters 1 through 3, where we learn of the judgment of God on Adam and Eve for their sin. And here are the words of God from Genesis 3. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So humans, the Bible teaches, were not initially created by God to die. But human death, we are told, entered the world as a result of judgment from God on human sin, and also very likely as a mercy of God to limit the impact of human sin. Consider that we are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that a people, people are appointed by God once to die, and after that face judgment. Furthermore, in regards to death and the maximum human lifespan, we are told in Genesis 6, 3, that God said, my spirit shall not, ab not abide a man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. And again, this 120-year limit aligns with much contemporary research into the natural limits of the human body, including the number of times our cells can replicate, or what is referred to as the Hayflick limit. So where does this leave us? Well, what I want to say, and it's a bold claim, is that the aging process has been appointed by God to result in our death. Mm -hmm. And by necessity, we would also that, say that such a natural or given process is in accord with the will of Jesus. I will add that the aging process is intended to restrict our lifespans to around a maximum of 120 years. Although I'm willing, again, to give or take several decades here. We might say that we know all this not only from the teachings of scripture, but again, from our observations in the natural world, both at a societal level and all the way down to the hallmarks of aging. But the crux of the matter is whether this is a divinely appointed limit of around 120 years, or if it's in some sense arbitrary. And the best interpretation of the Bible in the natural world seems to me that the current limits on the maximum human lifespan are indeed a divine appointment, understood broadly as both a blessing and a judgment. And this divine appointment idea seems to hold true for the great majority of positions held by Christians regarding human origin. So for what we might ask again is this limitation of 120 years for? We already indicated that it's a judgment and mercy of God, but we can find more clarity in the New Testament, which teaches that the whole universe was created by Jesus and for Jesus. Colossians 1.16 tells us this, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So we as embodied creatures were made by Jesus to know and to serve Jesus. In the wake of death entering the world through human sin, our finite time on earth can serve as teacher. From it, we learn to embrace our need for Jesus and to appropriately order our lives in service, love, and obedience to him. But to be made intelligible, Reflections on the acceptance of our finite lifespans must also take into account Jesus' work in bringing about a new creation or a perfect renewal of creation corrupted by sin, a renewal of not only ourselves as embodied souls, but the entire physical world. So listen to how Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15. For Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But in each turn, but each in his turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. And so for reflecting on these truths, we can say that the limited human lifespan no, lo no longer needs subject us, as the book of Hebrews tells us, to slavery through a lifetime of fear. This is because Jesus has defeated the enemy death through his death and resurrection and launched a new creation. And in a very real sense, as biblical scholar N.T. Wright says, this project of new creation has already been launched by Jesus upon his resurrection, as we were told that Christians are new creations in Christ, and that right now Christ rules over us in a special and particular way. And additionally, at the end of history, we know that the words of John from the book of Revelation will hold true, who reports this vision in chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. 
And here in this painting, we see a foretaste of the final and complete new creation and the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So let's return once again to examine the claims made by the young woman in our thought experiment. What I want to do now is get to the very bottom of her claims the best I can, or interrogate the existential values that might undergird her objections to the maximum human lifespan of around 120 years, as these objections would naturally be used to justify also the project of radical life extension. And when I speak of existential values, I'm referring to the beliefs we all hold relating to our place in the created order, our purposes in life, our ultimate ends, and the related matter of what true human flourishing looks like. And here I want to note that the New Testament's account and analysis of the life, work, and teachings of Jesus provide a critical lens through which we can evaluate the existential values undergirding the project of radical life extension. And you will see, and as I hope you'll see, such an approach opens up, or perhaps we might even say unlocks, so much more of the New Testament in terms of its relevancy to bioethical discussion. So here in our thought experiment, let's imagine now that the young woman is making her claims before the resurrected Jesus. So objecting to the maximum human lifespan of around 120 years, one might say again to Jesus, what about my family? Who's going to take care of them? Or Jesus, what about all the good work I'm undertaking, even works of mercy towards the poor and evangelism across the world? Someone might also say, because death is an enemy, isn't avoiding death for as long as possible a reasonable and even possibly a good thing? So these are all good questions, and let me answer them as I conclude the best I can. In regards to family, here's one thing that Jesus might say. From my time on earth, I know what it is to worry, but I am the head of my church, and to inter interject as myself here as an evangelical, I use this term simply to refer to all Christians throughout the world. But returning to Jesus, he might say that even on the precipice of my death, I trusted my followers to take care of my own family. Remember, I looked at my mother and then to John and said, Mother, here is your son, and son, here is your mother. Take heart, because I and my church, Jesus might say, will be there when you are not for your loved ones. It is not your place nor your purpose, Jesus might add, to look after them forever. And so in a sense, Jesus is saying that your desire for radical life extension is realized in and through the work of his church. In regards to our work, Jesus might say, one of your purposes in the world, as I told you as your creator and Lord, is to love others as I have loved you. That is, to love others with a self-sacrificial kind of love. But that was not all you were made for. You were also made to delight in me and to find rest in me, as the book of Hebrews tells us. So you could picture Jesus saying, my daughter, I give you rest. I and my church will continue on your good work. And finally, let's look at the question of whether death as an enemy is something to be avoided as long as possible. Speaking as myself, here I think we must go back again to the notion of Jesus as creator and the idea of the world being made by Jesus and for Jesus. So we can imagine Jesus saying, I, as your creator, have taken part in appointing your days. I have given you the time I have given you on earth. And remember, my daughter, you are a creature, and I am creator. Death, like birth, is part of the life cycle my father has assigned to all human beings. So speaking again as myself, it seems that the hallmarks of aging are part of the divinely appointed life cycle. And so I put forward the notion that aging should not be treated as a disease. And as a general rule, we should not intentionally seek to have the aging process reverse or undone as our primary aim in medical care. So in regards to both our lawsuit and the project of radical life extension, we might say that 90, 100, or perhaps even 120 years is enough time to live a purposeful and meaningful life, but also that these appointed years give our lives direction and that they are in a very real sense the right number of years for a human being to live. So it's not that we should passively accept death prematurely. As a general rule, we should fight disease and pain and suffering, partly because such heal and treatment is actually a foretaste or foreshadowing of the final and complete new creation that Christ will bring about. But this is a different matter than asking if I should seek to extend my life to something like a thousand years, which seems to me, as N.T. Wright might say, to be a perverse imitation of the promised new creation. It's not a question of whether living to 120 might be desirable. It's asking if we should seek to live past what is currently thought to be the maximum human lifespan, and if this would not be asserting our place above our creator and Lord. So trying to be aware of at least some of my limitations and my limited viewpoint at 35 years old, I will add that much more could be said about aging, like how our finite lifespans provide meaning to all aspects of our lives, or how aging can lead to wisdom, and how aging can make sense of the passing of time. And for further discussion, I would commend the work of Gilbert Mylander and the President's Council on Bioethics on these matters. But as many of you know, bioethics can be akin to a rebuke and a burden but it also can be more like the words of Jesus from Matthew 6, where he says, do not be anxious. 
This was not a command from our Lord for us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but rather a loving invitation from a father who might scoop up their child and say, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. In a similar vein, my conclusions today are offered in the spirit of removing burdens and not adding to them. And I want to do this by pointing us all to the gracious arms of Jesus, about whom Dostoevsky had this to say, I believe there is no deeper, lovelier, more sympathetic, and no per more perfect person than Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay, these are, have just been phenomenal uh, presentations. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for everyone um, even trimming your presentations to stay in time because we of our, our challenges. Really want to open it up uh, very quickly for questions. So we'll start and get through as many as we can. We'll keep going. Yes, sir. Uh, very interesting con considerations, um, for instance, regarding the multiplication of paternities, specifically maternities, in which you spoke of how one can speak of a genetic mother who is the Ov ovum donor. You could also speak of the conceiving mother. You could also speak of the gestating mother. Of course, these considerations, the multiplications of maternity, uh, also have implications for the vex question of so-called embryo rescue or embryo adoption. And in those debates, uh, which were kind of heated a few years ago, some people uh, attempted to compare and therefore to set aside gestating maternity to the wet nurse type of maternity, saying that it's something that could be a, a substitution, could be, be in accord with the natural order. Well, given that the gestating maternity may not be directly or intrinsically genetic, I'm just uh, wondering if you could go maybe a little bit deeper in analyzing those maternities and indicating why you consider the gestating maternity to be somehow necessarily the, uh, from, a, from an ethical order perspective, uh, ought to be unique along with the, the donating and the conceiving. Thank you. So, in the interest of time, I'll only say a couple, a couple of things. I mean, you ask a, a very complex set of questions. I'll only say a couple of things. The, the first is, uh, to recognize, I mean, first, I, I'm an Orthodox Christian rather than Roman Catholic. And one of the interesting uh, distinctions is, uh, or, or interesting implications of some of our analyses, is the sense of which uh, one is forbidden in general to bring third parties into uh, the reproductive relationship of husband and wife. Uh, and so the idea is uh, that the two become one uh, is uh, to have a serious ontological and, and thus biological implications. One is supposed to, in fact, be the father of one's children, and my wife is supposed to be the mother of my children. Uh, and so to bring a third party in, uh, so do donor gametes or donor embryos, including even embryo rescue, uh, would be seen as an inappropriate form of adultery uh, in a reproductive sense. Mm -hmm. So we have a somewhat different sort of way of looking at that in the sense of one's then severing that relationship in, in a way that one ought not to. Uh, even though one recognizes the evil which has uh, potentially been done in the creation of the embryos and the eventual destruction of the embryos, right? So uh, there's sort of those elements. The second, so real quickly, just as a comment, is part of what I was up to there is to point out how all of this reproductive technology uh, has really radically changed even the way we start to think about and puzzle through some of these kinds of relationships. Uh, adoption's been around long, long time. Uh, but now we have interesting and odd ways in which individuals can come together to create children and thus have all these different sorts of relationships uh, that are maternal and potentially paternal relationships, uh, and then trying to sort through what all that means uh, in terms of thinking about it, especially when we start talking about constructing the children that we want, uh, recognizing that that's routinely what's in fact going on. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Next question. I, I have a microphone. Um, very quickly for, for Andrew. Um, can you say a little bit more about why you're so skeptical about this possibility of, of living on 2,000 years and, and so forth, and why you put that at 120, so it's physically speaking, if you can? Sure. Um, I guess in, in regards to the skepticism, I'm part of a broader project with the boundaries of humanity where there's uh, 
I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian and a pastor, um, so I don't want to get too far ahead of my skis, but Bill Hurlbutt in the back and, and Dylan and others here in this group uh, who I've spoken with uh, talk about experience on, uh, experiments on animals that seem to indicate or seem to prove that we can extend life rather significantly, perhaps 30 or 50 percent. Well, the human being is just such a more complex system, and I think as Professor Hayflick said, um, that Again, there's, there's just a natural limit of cell death after 40 to 60 replications that it seems to be built into the human being. And so, I, again, just speaking as a layperson, I believe it might one day very much be possible to radically exceed that limit, but likely not in the year, near term. And that 120 year number, I'm trying to be careful and give a few decades on either side, um, but that is drawn from uh, aging and longevity research and research into the hallmarks of aging, which seems to indicate that there is seems to be a natural limit of about 120, and if we want to go to 150, that wouldn't particularly bother me. Um, but as I didn't have a chance to get into, part of what bothers me as well is how that would transform, as the President's Council wrote 20 years ago, uh, family relationships, mm -hmm. social relationships. Uh, I'm, I'm a historian of Malthus, and that would frighten me quite a bit that we would almost have to uh, place limits on fertility, and that would also encourage eugenic interventions. Well, if someone's going to live to 1,000, you don't want them to, quote unquote, have a defect as well. Yes. Um, this is from Matthew Eric. I'm, I was really interested in the, um, the point you made about humans encountering limits. Um, because it strikes me that part, like a natural human experience only has a limit if she was trying to figure out how to get around it. And that doesn't seem to be only to be about sin. It also seems to be that this, this desire to transcend ourselves seems to be also to be a deeply human experience. So I was wondering if you could say more about kind of appealing to our experience of being human to figure out what these key human experience benchmarks are when we're trying to figure out what not to go beyond. Does that make sense? So, yeah, that makes perfect things. sense. Uh, and I think that that's, um, that's not an easy uh, task. And I think it, it, you actually have to look at specific issues to do it. So for example, life extension might be an example, a good example, like thinking about what the consequences might be of trying to uh, tr uh, live beyond uh, the, the natural limit of a human lifespan as we currently know it, like, which is, as far as I understand, 120 years, give or take um, 10 years or so. And I think that that's um, that that analysis is important. However, I, I would um, I would say that uh, we can also look to um, to literature um, for guidance on this question, um, like classic novels like um, Frankenstein, but also like short stories like The Birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, for a bit of an idea of what the the kind of hubris that I'm talking about looks like in uh, a bit more of a uh, creative um, uh, uh, conception um, of, of um, or, or sort of more, more of a concrete um, account of uh, someone trying to uh, transcend just the very reality of imperfection that characterises our existence. Um, I, uh, the last thing I'd say is I, I think it's important that we don't, we don't think of transhumanism as um, a concept that, that's not capable of being redeemed. Um, and this is quite a radical proposal here, but I actually think a lot of Christian theology um, can be understood as a form of transhumanism, not, not, not in the sense that we understand it now, but I mean, there's a sense in which we want to, like, we, we don't want to die, and Christ redeemed us and saved us from death. Um, and that's important, like, it speaks to an aspect of our um, our human nature that uh, um, that that I think is um, should not be dismissed as sinful, as you say. Um, however, I think it's the way in which we uh, we concretely try to um, overcome the human condition uh, that's problematic and uh, reflects vices rather than virtues of character. That, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Excellent. So I regret to say that we are at time, but I encourage everyone who has questions to stay and, and spend some time talking to our panelists. This has been a very stimulating uh, panel, and I want to thank you very much for being a good audience. And thank our panelists.